the plug or you can't get your goggles on. The best of the best the eastern regional riders gathered in Johnstown, Pennsylvania over the weekend for a first-time, one-of-a-kind event. As long as you were a top 15 rider in your class and as long as you were on a new Suzuki RM, you were invited to the party. There were races for all classes, and with over $70,000 in prize money, no one went home empty-handed. Mechanics could be pretty sure that parts were easy to find. Need a Suzuki spark plug? No problem. Tired of fitting RM250? We got one. And whoever had the idea to put numbers on these things should get the biggest trophy. Can you imagine wandering off to the hot dog stand and trying to find your bike? Uh, let's see. Uh, it's the yellow one. The new pro veterans class went off first, and 32-year-old former GP rider Billy Lyles ran to the checkers. Not even a flat tire could keep him from winning and then praising the event all around. Suzuki's probably put together one of the best programs that uh, the, the local racer rider has ever seen, and uh, I'm real impressed with it. And uh, it seems they're going to continue in 96 and uh, looking forward to a few, few more great years in racing. The 125A class saw pre-race favorite Davey Ezek looking for a win. The weekend wasn't without its ups and downs for a few riders. But Yezik was able to eventually deliver the goods, although he carried on quite a scrap before being able to show off for the crowd. When the 7 to 11 ADCC minis took to the track, there seemed no doubt that number one, Travis Pastrana, would be able to run away with the race. Once the inevitable became reality, Pastrana concentrated on staying error-free and then honing his ESPN highlight film skills. A rare opportunity to ride for the pure fun of it. I like it a lot. It's kind of, it's really fun because all the guys are Suzuki, so you know all the competition's real fast. 16-year-old Texan Charlie Bogard made the most of his last amateur race, winning the 125B event, putting on a clinic, then adding the 250B win, picking up some major dough, two Suzuki jackets, and leading a reserved and dignified tribute to the folks who made it all possible. Seems like everybody's having a good time. I see we've got a lot of just fans out here that ain't even racing, so that's good. Looks like it's a good deal for Suzuki, and I uh, hope we do it again. The 250A class was quite a scramble at the start. A few riders had trouble all trying to fit into the same spot. After a while, though, things began to sort themselves out behind number 29, Cliff Palmer, who led the field through on the first lap. Others came up to challenge, but fell short as Palmer took the checkers, which led to the jacket and the check. Brian Trevor reporting for Moto World. Thanks, Brian. Look for the Western Regional RM Cup event in Carson City, Nevada. All right, I started on my bike today sometime. <laughs> I want to make sure that guy brings it back to me. I mean, it's like it's the only bike I have. McGrath and Lamson cap a red letter season at the National Motocross Finale. The Sultan of Springfield takes another step toward the dirt track thrown in Illinois. And the new King of Trials comes through with a clutch ride to keep his crown. Get the idea? It's title time on Moto World. Moto World is brought to you by Honda Motorcycles, the leader in on and off-road fun. Honda, come ride with us. Discover today's motorcycling. For the straight facts on motorcycling, call 1-800-833-3995. And by Suzuki. Right now, your Suzuki dealer has the ride you've been waiting for and the financing to get it. Hello again, everyone. It's now official. The McGrath era in AMA National Motocross has begun. I'm Bob Varsha. Art Ekman is standing by with the dramatic story of a season-ending Honda sweep. We'll begin with the 250s. Now, when the season opened at Gainesville, Florida back in March, Jeremy McGrath went to great lengths to express his commitment to winning a first national title, to go with what has become a streak of three straight 250 Supercross crowns. Last weekend, seven months and an equal number of overall wins later, that goal was achieved. And he clinched the championship in a style that only befits a man who calls himself Showtime, Art. I'd say so, Bob. He set the Steel City track on fire, going 1-1, one, one, 
that meant that he ended the season with five straight Moto wins. I've covered Jeremy from the moment he burst on the scene, and in my mind, this title is the direct result of Jeremy's efforts to paint a new self-portrait. Not just a brash supercross rider with a bundle of talent, but now a mature competitor looking to be the best ever. And last weekend, it was vintage McGrath. Moto One saw John Dowd, Mike Kudrowski, Phil Lawrence, Larry Ward, and James Dobb out early with Jeremy, but no Jeff Emig. Number six got a late start, then got caught up in a massive crash in turn two. Any slim hopes of a title slipping away. Emig would get going again in 18th after the first lap, battling back to a sixth place finish. Meanwhile, Jeremy McGrath was taking the lead quickly and running away to a four and a half second advantage in the opening lap. Dodd number 16 has had some outstanding moments this season, but they've been few and far between. Here he moves by Dowd into second. This would be the best battle of the race, lasting some nine minutes. Dowd finally recapturing second place to stay. Within the first five laps, McGrath was pulling a double digit lead. Larry Ward on his way to fifth and his best overall showing of the season. McGrath, the Checkers, and the 1995 title. Outdoor Nationals takes a lot of, a lot of time testing, and the bikes, they got to be prepared every week, over and over again. And, and uh, you know, it's just a complete team that takes a whole effort. I finally put my mind to it, and I think it just helped everyone else work so much harder. The second 250 moto was like a walkout fight in boxing. McGrath already securing the 250 title, lamps in the 125s in exciting fashion, and Jeremy gets the whole shot. Emig, looking for redemption, battling for pride's sake. He went outside. Jeremy goes inside. The early dice for third before dropping back was between series part-timer Doug Dubach, number 28, and privateer Pennsylvania native son Mike Jones, number 62. McGrath was nowhere to be seen by the rest of the field. A 15-second lead by the halfway mark. The only question to be settled was for third behind Emig. John Dowd, number 14, and Larry Ward, number 11. The sometimes side-by-side -side battle was settled when Dowd made the pass for third to capture a second place overall. McGrath, Emig, Dowd, Ward, and Kudrowski, the top five in the year's final moto. McGrath's 11th win in 24 motos. Here's how they ended up in the championship points race. McGrath by 60 points over Emig, Kudrowski in third, then Dowd, Kyle Lewis in fifth, Ward, LaRocco, Lawrence, Dowd, and Albertine rounding out the top ten. Great stuff. Now, Art, Jeremy's title had to be the headline after the first moto, but there was some other news floating around the paddock as well. That's right. Mike Kudrowski had a very fine first moto, placed third, even with a sore knee. But there was a lot of rumors flying around about the possibility of Mike retiring. He surprised me by telling us. Mike Kudrowski was one of this sport's most accomplished outdoor national competitors. Classy and accommodating to the fans off the track. On the track, Kudrowski was one of only two riders in motocross history to win the Triple Crown. Jeff Ward the other. Three Daytona Supercross wins. Another highlight of his outstanding career. I think I will be retiring and um, I'll be con doing some consulting work for Kawasaki and stuff and, you know, helping out the other riders coming up. I didn't want to announce I was retiring. I didn't want a farewell, farewell uh, tour thing and all that. And I just wanted to quit and get out of it. And, you know, I'll see the fans around. Typical Kudrowski, no fanfare, just a simple confirmation that one of the greatest careers in motocross is now coming to an end. It sounds like Kawasaki could use Kudrowski's help next year, though, considering that both he and Mike LaRocco are now off the Green Factory 250s. And especially with the youngsters coming on to Team Kawasaki, his talents certainly can be used. We plan on getting Kudrowski into our Motor World studio soon to talk about his illustrious career, of course, and his future. You bet we do. Now, how about the 125 highlights? Ready to go? Oh, exciting. You bet your life, Bob. I barely believed what I saw, and I was at the track. Well, let's let the folks sit on the edge of their seats for a moment while we check the 250 motocross action overseas on this week's 1-800-COLLECT Honda scoreboard. Stefan Everts of Belgium came into the season's last round in France locked in a points battle with countryman Marnique Bervotes. Everts proceeded to go a brutal 15-3 and three for eighth place overall, so he lost the title, right? Wrong. Fair votes fell out of the first moto. Everts is the 95 world champion by 43 points over American Talon Volan, whose two seven finishes netted him second overall in the finale. Ahead on Moto World, the struggle for the 125 National Motocross title ends in the last corner of the last moto. A dark cloud holds the proverbial silver lining for Michael Martin in Wira Formula USA Road Racing. And up next, a surprise ending to the national trials season. Move over young, the new kid is here to stay. We'll be right back.
Winning a single Supercross is no easy feat. Jeremy McGrath has won three Supercross championships in a row. For Honda, that makes eight straight. Are you up for that? How do you visualize your future? This or this? Call Motorcycle Mechanics Institute and get on the fast track to success. Endorsed by all five major manufacturers, the MMI professionals will provide the technician training to give you control of your future. I'm currently in charge of Team Suzuki Yoshimura's Super Sport program. I wouldn't be here today without MMI on my resume. Call Motorcycle Mechanics Institute now to train for your future. Suzuki Dual Sport 650, 350, 250, and 125. No other line has a wider range. Welcome back to Motor World. In the sport of trials riding, last year's championship upset by teenager Jeff Aaron may have appeared to be only a hiccup in the glittering reign of perennial titleist Ryan Young. Last week, Aaron answered any question about his ability with a clutch performance worthy of, well, a championship. The 1995 trials season started as planned for 1994's first-time champion Jeff Aaron. Any questions whether six-time national champion Ryan Young would fade away were quickly dismissed when the pair split this year's opening round in Prescott, Arizona. Now, nine rounds later, Cannon City, Colorado, and Aaron would face some huge obstacles. A world-class course on Saturday gave Jeff Fitz 98 points and a disappointing third-place finish behind Oliver Clamageron. More importantly, Young put the New England native in a desperate situation. Win on Sunday, or Young would all but wrap up his seventh national title. Aaron showed poorly on Saturday, but laid the groundwork for a strategic mental campaign. He finished the third and final loop with the day's low score of 19, and then continued the pace on Sunday with loops of 23, 17, and 9, respectively. A 49-point total and two points in front of second place Young. And I just had about two little mistakes, which on easy days, mistakes will come back to haunt you, and uh, I knew that I wouldn't ever be able to overcome that. With two rounds remaining, both in Tillamook, Oregon, Aaron would need the sweep. Young, only the event split. Still, Jeff can play the head games, though, with the best of them. Trials is a mental game, there's no doubt about it. And, uh, and I think that there's a little bit of mind games going on, but um, if you're confident and you uh, ride your own event, um, I don't see why you can't disregard what the other rider's doing and just do your own thing. Well, overconfidence paid off for Aaron. He wins them both in Oregon, thus securing his second championship in as many years. He also extended the scope of those mind games beyond the trials world. Uh, I'm going to continue to do the nationals, and uh, I also hope to do some other uh, motorsports, uh, maybe motocross, hair scrambles, maybe some enduros. Now let's turn to the flat tracks. Art, have you any idea how long it's been since an Illinois native won an AMA Grand National event at the Springfield Mile? Oh, let's see. 1953, Bill Tuman uh, on an Indian. Ah, I, I confess. I looked it up. My God, I hope so. I hope you also <laughs> noticed that this year's points leader, Scotty Barker, had won 10 of the last 16 main events at the Illinois State Fairgrounds Oval. Now, if Chris Carr is the Prince of Peoria, Scotty is surely the Sultan of Springfield. 
Labor Day weekend marked the second chance this year for thousands of race fans to flock to the legendary mile. Back on Memorial Day weekend, they saw Chris Carr win by a wheel length over Kevin Atherton. Last Sunday, they witnessed another classic. At the start, Illinois' Davey Camlin could all but taste a win, wanting desperately to quench the drought atop the Springfield podium for natives of the land of Lincoln. But the whole shot went to Steve Moorhead, with number 58 Dave Durrell coming from the wing for second spot, ahead of number 80 Rich King. After the green flag, Mike Hacker shook things up. Hey, if you're going to go down, the safest place to do it is in the back of the pack, right? And back of the pack is where Hacker found himself for the single file restart. Moorhead again with the early lead. But Steve soon began to run out of steam, surrendering to Camlin, then sliding out of the groove and all the way back to a ninth place finish. Now, if Camlin chose to look behind him, he'd see the number one of series leader Scotty Parker passing Atherton for second. Then Scotty made the move on the inside of turn one to get by Camlin for the front position. But this was far from a definitive statement. The lead would shift another eight times before the checkered flag. Down to the white flag they come. Chris Carr with the lead over Parker, Camlin, Atherton, and Durrell. On the backside, Parker and Camlin sneak by for the lead, and it's a two-rider race. Down the stretch, they come to the flag. Parker by a foot. Guys was everywhere. I felt like I had a real good hand of cards that Bill Warner put together. All I had to do was play him right. And, uh... It come down to the end and decided what I had to do, and it was running into three and four as hard as I can and let them guys try to draft me down the straightaway. <laughs> and Scotty will whoop again when he sees his points lead has grown to 56 over King with the part-timer Carr in third. It's looking like another Scotty Parker kind of season. Now, Motor World and the Motorcycle Mechanics Institute are looking for viewers ready to kickstart a career in motorcycle technology. Call 1-800-225-1234 for details about our latest scholarship worth $5,000, good at MMI campuses in either Orlando or Phoenix. That number again is 1-800-225-1234. Now, in a moment, Motor World will be back with a cliffhanger of a finish in 125 National Motocross. You don't want to miss this. Moto World is being brought to you in part by the Motorcycle Mechanics Institute, the only major manufacturer-endorsed motorcycle training institution. This could be your arm. This could be your back. This could be your stomach. This could be your thigh. These could be your shoulders. This could be your body. This could be the way. The Solaflex Muscle Machine. Call now for a free brochure. This could be your arm. This could be your chest. These could be your shoulders. This could be your thigh. This could be your stomach. This could be your back. This could be your body. This could be the way. The Solaflex Muscle Machine. Call now for a free brochure. I'm on a beach in Mexico, you see? And I'm sitting in a shade, and there's a, a kid looking at me. So uh, my daughter's there, my grandson, and my wife's down, who's a big broad. I mean, a big lady. She's down <laughs> on a, sunning herself on the beach, and this kid's looking at me, and he comes up to me, and he says, Excuse me, are you Frank Gifford? Oh, what the hell is this kid, blind? And my daughter says, yeah, and there's Kathy Lee down on the beach. <laughs> my wife plays three times as much as Kathy Lee. <laughs> Team Suzuki presents the Motor World Suzuki event calendar. A look at some of the major events coming up in the world of motorcycles and ATVs. Topping this week's Suzuki calendar, from trials to motocross to road racing, the year's biggest vintage motorcycle event is coming up the 13th through the 17th in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. You want a tight championship race? Check out the AMA Hill Climbers as they roost the rise in Middlebury, Indiana, Sunday the 17th. And in the Mountaineer State, the Grand National Cross Country title chase will visit Bunner Ridge. You can catch the quads on the 16th, the two-wheelers the 17th, or simply sit back and tune in to Moto World. 
Welcome back to Moto World. Art, we thought the 125 National Motocross title fight would go right down to the last event, but not like this. What an incredible season. Seven different moto winners, five riders took turns leading the points, not to mention Steve Lampson's late season charge from nowhere to the points lead. Well, then came last weekend. Lampson and Ryan Hughes toe-to-toe -to -toe for the championship, and it went right down to the last corner. The day at Steel City started with Lampson leading Hughes by just three points. Huffman, 16 points back in third, would jump the gate and have to come from 18th, eliminating him from any title chance. Number 43, Kevin Windham, coming off his finest finish the week before, took the early lead away from hole shooter Michael Craig. Lampson, number five, moving quickly into second, past number 708, Ryan Huffman. And number nine, Hughes, jockeyed his way into third, all by the second lap around the Steel City track. Adding an interesting twist to the points battle, Wyndham was building a bit of a lead. Lampson was looking a little tense. Ryan Hughes, knowing he was down three points, was letting it all hang out. Lap three, Hughes got by Lampson for second. A finish in this order, and they'd go to the final race with Lampson still up by one point. Just three minutes later, though, Hughes would move into the lead. A Hughes first place and Lampson third place would give Hughes a two-point advantage going into the final moto. Lampson wasn't going to let that happen, though. After a terrific duel with Wyndham, he finally got by for second place. Lampson made his move a little late and was hoping Hughes riding on the edge would lose it. But he didn't. Hughes, the checkers, picks up the three points, tying Lampson in the season's championship race. This race is all or nothing, you know. I said, if I ain't going to win, I'm going to crash. So I rode as hard as I could. Those guys rode good, but had a little some good lines out there and tried keeping uh, the pace going and worked out really good. So it's like starting the season all over now. Yeah, it's one moto race right here. It's tied points, so... So it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting. Hughes, Lampson, Wyndham, Pichon, and Craig, the top five in Moto1. Lampson came out in Moto2, a much different rider. The whole shot and a lead the Honda rider would never relinquish. Mike Brown, number 26, diced along with Lammy and then had his hands full with Hughes. Hughes into second place. Brown would finish in third. Mikhail Pichon would secure a fourth place in the Moto, good enough for a third place overall. Lampson was magnificent in keeping his pace up. Hughes, overjumping, pushing his bike as far as it would go, couldn't bite into Lammy's four to five second lead. Number 12, Damon Huffman takes on the day's top privateer, Scott Sheik, and passes for fourth. Sheik, the day's $500 winner, Chad Pedersen, won the Camel's Skull $5,000 check as the year's top 125 rider. Up front, Hughes was moving toward desperation. Then, what made the most dramatic finish to a 125 season the most emotional? Lampson, the checkers, and his first title ever. Hughes's chain broke, and the finish line was uphill. Ryan had worked too hard for this day. He wasn't going to cheat himself. Hughes, to a tremendous ovation, pushed his bike across the finish line, collapsing with exhaustion and the weight of losing the 125 championship. Lampson, Brown, Hughes, Pichon, Huffman, the top five, had them all up. And here's how the season ended. Lampson by five points over Hughes. Huffman, Brown, and Pichot make the top five, with Raynard, Ferry, Pedersen, Sheik, and Stevenson rounding out the top ten. From Steel City, Ryan and Lammy are headed for Europe as teammates at the Motocross de Nations. Ryan will straddle a 500, while Lammy's going to be on a 125. And these guys are already looking ahead to next season. Lampson signed a new contract with Honda late Sunday night after clinching the crowd. And Hughes, he's going to be a 250 rider with Team Kawasaki, Bob. What a finish. Thanks, Art. That wraps up motocross for this week. After a break, we'll go road racing here on Moto World, so stay with us. Here in America for more than a decade before a shocking upset at the hands of the British in 1994. This year's U.S. team of Ryan Hughes, Jeff Emig, and Steve Lamson came up a painful point short of a tough Belgian trio. And we now have those pictures, Art. Bob, as you'll see, the American riders have absolutely nothing to be ashamed about. Uh, in fact, with a little bit of luck, they would have brought back the trophy. More than 30,000 fans gathered for this international motocross festival, and they were treated to some great racing. Suspenseful up until the very end of the three-moto event. Each rider of the three-man teams runs two motos. It was the 500s or open class and the 125s in moto number one. Belgium's Joel Smets on a four-stroke Husaberg takes the whole shot. Smets keeps the thunderous four-stroke out in front to win his first of two open division victories. 
Smets is the 500 world champ, but take your hat off for number four Kawasaki's Ryan Hughes. Competing all season long on 125s, he took a second place in both 500 motos. An outstanding accomplishment in his first Major League 500 debut. Back in the pack, the star in Moto 1. Number nine, the Kawasaki to the outside. A 17-year-old Frenchman named Sebastian Tortelli. Tortelli dominated the 125s, taking the checkers in front of 250 world champ Stefan Everts, riding a 125 for Belgium, and U.S. Nationals 125 champion Steve Lampson in third. Moto 2 featured 125s again and the 250s. America's 250 rider Jeff Emig, number five, got the whole shot and led the first 13 minutes of the 30 minute plus two lap moto. Once again, back in the pack, Tortelli took his 125 past both Everts and Lampson for an identical 1-2-3-125 one, finish. The 250 was an eye-opener. A German number 14 pit fire on the Honda with a sleeve rolled up fought his way from fifth place to win the opening 250 round. Emig held off number 11, Belgium's Marnik for votes for second place. The final moto and the 500s were back joining the 250s. And this is where it got nail-biting exciting. The U.S. team needed to win both classes to win the title. The 500 Husky of Sweden's Peter Johansson took the lead. The Belgian Bervots went down out of the first turn and would battle back for only an eighth-place finish. Number 14, Pitt Byer, looking for a double win in the 250s, passed for the lead. But he would go down hard. Emig took advantage of Byer's misfortune, taking his 250 past Johansson's 500 for the lead. Emig rocketed to a six-second lead on Smets, who also had gotten by Johansson. Hughes, in fourth, needed to beat Smets for a U.S. victory, so Emig slowed up, hoping to bunch up the field in back of him, holding them up to give Hughes some shots at passing. It worked. Hughes reeled in the Englishman, Nicole, close behind Smets, but with four laps to go, Nicole lost control right in front of Hughes. They both went down, ending U.S. hopes. For Emig, it was showtime, winning the overall 250 class. Hughes remounted for a second place in the open class, but it was Smets, who had seen his team lose the trophy by a point, celebrating the first championship for Belgium since Roger de Coster days. De Coster, ironically, this year's U.S. team captain. Tortelli, vaulting France into third place. All right, thanks, Art. Back on these shores, the National Hill Climb Championship is enjoying a great two-class struggle for 95 bragging rights. In fact, second and 12. He could get any kind of coverage scheme. The deep holder, the moisture Sandro Huzar, number 1A, took the lead with Alessio Chioti in second. McGrath, number one, was in good shape in third with Jimmy Button, number 10, in fourth. Number eight, Talon Bolin, an American riding the European circuit, was in fifth. Bartoloni, Larry Ward, Hughes, and Bradshaw next in the chase. The combination of good money, fans, and fun times lures the top American riders. I think this place is cool. It's insane, man. What can you say? Yeah, they're friendly, crazy. Uh, I think your favorite thing about Italy is the food. <laughs> I love coming over here. Uh, you get paid just to be here, um, so that's good. They put a really good show on the Sap Rudy. They're probably the best promoters in the world. You know, I raced in Italy one year, uh, only one time a year, and it's at this track. And this track's probably the, one of the best tracks in the world, too, so... Yeah, that's fun. The track survived a Saturday rain well. It's been compared with a Troy, Ohio, or Washougal with lots of speed and bigger jumps. There's no question, this left turn has two lines. Huzar had his troubles in the whoops as Jeremy pressures Coyote. After moving into second, it was the whoops where Jeremy made his move on Huzar. Out of the tunnel, in the lead, McGrath would pull away. Come start by this Arrivando da Cino, no? È abbastanza buono perché. When in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? Well, it's not Rome, but Trampas Parker from Louisiana talking with Motor World European correspondent Sergio Villa obviously has adjusted well while riding the European circuit. Number 10, Jimmy Button moved into third despite this discomforting look after crashing in Saturday's preliminary race. Pleased with a third place finish in the main, he told Moto World he'd like to come back to race in the States, but it's more realistic thinking he'll be back for a second season in Europe next year. I have a couple of deals I'm working on right now, but it looks like I'm going to be back in uh, Europe for 96 on the 125 Grand Prix. McGrath, with a six-second lead over Puzar, kicked into his Showtime act, and the fans went bananas. Pointing to the fans on jumps, progressed to a knack-knack on this one. Of course, not all riders went through the air with equal control. The checkers, and again, both feet off the pegs from a grab. 
I've been to Arsaga like five years and first time winning, so it's nice. <laughs> McGrath, Buzar, and Button on the podium with Kyoto and Bolden in the top five. Hughes, Bradshaw, Ward, Huffman, and Saturday's prelim winner Emig rounding out the top ten. Jeremy McGrath plans a month off and then the Supercross World Championship Series before the 1996 Supercross season begins stateside. Back on this side of the pond, Team Suzuki Endurance recently notched their seventh We're Along. Most famous Mirage Resort. The High Banks of Daytona produce high expectations from road racing championship hopefuls. For today's motorcycling, for the straight facts on motorcycling, call 1-800-833-3995. And by Suzuki. Right now, your Suzuki dealer has the ride you've been waiting for and the financing to get it. Hello again, everyone. I'm Bob Varsha. Welcome to another edition of Moto World. Art Ekman is here as always, and somewhere out in the wide, wide world, Jeremy McGrath is celebrating what has to be the best season of his career, Art. Say this for McGrath, he gives the customers what they paid for, having sewn up or virtually sewn up the World Supercross title and bank checks worth a fat six figures in the process. Any other racer might have been tempted to punch up the cruise control for the remainder of his European appearances. But not showtime, especially not in the motorcycle-mad heart of Italy. Genoa might have been the birthplace of Christopher Columbus, but on this day, Jeremy McGrath was the hero of the moment. They even crowned him king. Despite not being part of the World Championship Series, this one-off has always been popular with the American riders. Fans are really, really loud and really crazy. Uh, another thing that's really fun is these smaller tracks were in a smaller venue, so the tracks are uh, real tight with real big jumps, so you got to be on your toes at all times. Off the start, McGrath went to the inside. Number 16, Jeff DeMette, went wide. The slingshot move into the early lead. Number 9, Honda of Troy's Michael Craig takes Jeremy in the whoops. Dement, Ward, and Talon Bolin looking good early. McGrath, after a so-so start, moves past Ward into second. Craig still looking strong. It wasn't long into this 20-lap main event that Craig and McGrath were passing lappers and making a close race of it. Jeremy gets the angle and the block pass in the corner. Trying to pull a lead is easier said than done on this tight and technical track. Look out, Jeremy. It's basically a standard bike. I had a pro circuit suspension. Um, my Honda stuff was at home. I didn't really get to use it this weekend. Craig, who won his qualifying heat, stayed close for a lap before Team Honda's Steve Lampson takes him in the whoops. The whoops later swallowed up Craig. Number seven, Mikel Pichon, the Frenchman and opportunist, moves into second place. Local favorite, Alessandro Puzar, was also forced to retire early. Larry Ward, the only rider to beat McGrath during the European season, got into the main after winning the last chance qualifier. He would finish in fifth. McGrath may be king for the ninth in Genoa, but he played Superman again, taking the checkers. He's already got his 96 training schedule figured out. I had my vacation in September, so... Right now I'm racing and, and having fun and doing some testing on my bike at home and and uh, I think if I can go home and we have one month after Geneva until Orlando so if, if I take some rest and two weeks rest, two weeks training, I think I'll be okay. McGrath's going to need a luggage allowance to get that mega trophy back. McGrath the winner again, Lampson, Fashone, Dement and Ward the top five, Monty Bocelli the top Italian in sixth place. Thanks Art. Now, that Italian event was not a points-paying round of the FIM-sanctioned World Supercross Series, which wrapped up in Geneva, Switzerland last weekend. We'll serve up all the facts and figures of that event to headline this week's 1-800-COLLECT Honda Scoreboard. Maybe we spoke too soon last week when we said Jeremy McGrath had clinched his second World Supercross title. Mathematically, it turns out he actually needed to race in Geneva to close the deal, though his championship, in our opinion, was inevitable. But then again, on Saturday night, Jeremy was nowhere near the podium. Supermac crashed and chipped five teeth in the first race and wound up seven laps back by the end of the event, leaving the door wide open for Damon Huffman aboard his new Kawasaki. Bill Lawrence and Honda of Troy's newest recruit, Larry Ward, shared the podium. Ward's 96 teammate Mike Brown and Pro Circuit's Ryan Hughes rounded out the top five. 
In the final round Sunday night, Huffman gave another strong performance, but finished behind the McGrath Express. Yamaha factory rider John Dowd took third. Mikel Pichon and Mike Brown filled out the rostrum. The Geneva rounds conclude the World Supercross Series for 95, and McGrath wins the title by a decisive 23-point margin over Larry Ward. Now, coming up later on Moto World, we'll introduce you to as inspiring a motorcycle racer as you'll ever meet. We'll also do some arena hopping across the... This, this whole class, without Emig and Henry, who had already won titles, really represent the changing of the guard for, for motocross. I think one interesting factor was we had some veterans like Craig and Swink coming back, as well as Lampson on Hondas coming back, uh, fairly veteran riders, against kids like Ferry, Brown, that were looking to prove themselves. And Wyndham. And yeah. Wyndham, Kevin Wyndham. Proven uh, his speed in the Supercross, just didn't have the stamina, and outdoors, it's a little bit tougher, longer races, but the kid gets off to a good start, and a national, that could be uh, good news. Must oh. be disappointing for a veteran like Swank and Craig not to do very well. I think so, especially once they move back to the 125 class, and then they don't do as well, it's, it's I think, even a little worse. Yeah, let's switch back now to the real contenders. It came down to Lampson versus Hughes, and what a classic battle this is, because they're totally different personalities, both on the bike and off the bike. Their riding technique is so different. It was a classic battle, and really, I think that we were effectively counting Lampson out at one stage, 61 points down. Who would have thought that he could have make up that kind of deficit, especially on guys like Hughes, who stayed healthy and just battled right to the end? Right, oh, I, I certainly didn't think he was going to, I don't think he thought that he was going to, had a chance to win the championship, and uh, that the other guys were fairly inconsistent through the first uh, half of the season, and, and by the time they picked together. it up, he was in there. Right, four straight overalls. It's pretty dominant. It was, it was tough to compete with that. I mean, I was looking at, the, everybody was very consistent. They had a, maybe a bad moto here or there, or DNF, but, but uh, pretty consistent, and, and up near the front, top three, and when, when you put together back-to-back -to -back motos and four <laughs> overall victories, you, you can't compete with that. Lampson was so steady, and you have to be a steady rider to do that, but he's a quiet guy that nobody knows a lot about because he didn't win any amateur titles to speak of. Loretta, Loretta Lynn's one time, uh, but, he, but he really is void of a championship, and he needed this. This is his third year in Honda. You know, it's very important for guys. The one thing you can never take away, David, as you know, is championships. People forget who wins races, but they never forget who wins championships. Then you got uh, Rhino, Hughes, who's, you know, let's, let's ride on the <laughs> edge all the time, and that makes it exciting for the fans. Well, I think that was a classic battle, the two completely opposites uh, on the motorcycle and off. Uh, they're both fighters, they're both tough, they both do well on rough racetracks, they both do good on all conditions. And uh, it, was a, it was a great fight, right to, the, right to the very end. There's another thing I like about the 125s, and that is they're usually youngsters. And then you get off the factory-supported or independent teams, and you get privateers. And their main objective, beside the love of the sport, is to open the eyes of the factory managers. Hey, give me a shot. Look it, I'm good. And the privateer race, like in from like maybe 6th to, through 10th, mm -hmm. was fantastic this year. That was excellent. And uh, Brian Deegan... Uh, Chad Pedersen, uh, Stevenson, right. A lot of those guys that get good starts and run up in there, and they'd run with those guys for a long time. And when we talked about that, you know, is this going to play a role in factory ride for next year? Well, if they could continue to stay up there to the very end, but it made things exciting for a while. Mixed it up for the Chad uh, the Pedersen guys. finally uh, pulling it off, and the privateers—they're the ones that need that extra money. <laughs> That's true. You know, they gave us some great excitement because they were hanging it out just like Ryan Hughes was, but they really couldn't keep it up for the entire distance. But there were a few guys, David, like you mentioned, took it all the way to the end with great finishes. Your general impression of 1995 before we go to break. Well, for me, I think we found out that the 125, everyone has said, is a lot harder to ride than the 250. And just like a guy like Craig or a Swink can come from 250, it's not guaranteed success. But Lampson... He had what he needed to get it done. Well, he had some experience. He was also second last year. And I thought, well, he may be the favorite then. And uh, in the first round, he looked fantastic. He won the first moto with ease. And he talked about he could have gone even faster. But then the DNF and the injury put him out of there. And uh, he just he had the poise to come back and take it. The drama of the year was virtually losing three motos and coming back to win a championship. Five riders held the points lead throughout the season. Suzuki's Damon Huffman was the front runner for almost the entire first half. We'll have a look at the action when we return. The 1995. You don't have all that power to get up some of those hills, but you've got good maneuverability. 
Well, 125, you can muscle around a little bit more. 250 is hard to get stopped. You got to be a little bit more careful on the throttle. It's very slick there. All the sand is gone from that racetrack. And you got to keep your momentum at 125. Yeah. Especially the sand below and hard pack up above. Plus, it gets real choppy. Mm -hmm. and you go from some uh, kind of sand, whoop to do rolly stuff like what you'd see later in the season at Southwick uh, to choppy stuff and hard yep. pack. Guy has everything. It's really challenging. In round number one, it was Steve Lampson in the first Moto Yon that just looked so dominant. They said, whoops, there goes the series. Well, he did, but the interesting thing was that Huffman repeated what he did in Supercross. He got the whole shot. And then as the race progressed, Lampson really showed what he had. Now, there is, with 125 outdoors, is it possible the Suzuki doesn't quite have the pull that the Honda does? Because it seemed in that sandy soil, once Lampson really got going, he could really pull in on Huffman. Well, he, he bragged about his bike. He goes, my bike is awesome. And that thing sounded good. I think he was making sound effects of how his bike sounded out there. And, and uh, possibly. But, uh, well, Robbie Raynard's Kawasaki sounded pretty good in the, in the second <laughs> one. And of course, I, I never forget the picture of Steve Lampson in the pits with his head down on the bike as he came in after such a dominating first moto. And then the second moto, a bent wheel and they had to come in and change it, and he didn't score any points in that moto. That was a case of, you know, landing on top of a jump and just slamming it, knowing that there was a problem, and then really Team Honda came to the rescue. He did, you know, he didn't get back in the points paying positions, but at least they got him back out there. And that was a case of just bad luck. And what a time to have bad luck, David, in the second moto of the year. Right, well, so the track is brutal, and it took its toll on the riders in the 250 class as well. And, as far as his head down like that, I mean, it's, he's probably thinking that's the title. That's the title right there. The first race of the season, now maybe playing catch-up the whole year, and that's no fun. Swink and Craig didn't have a good time either. Uh, Swink uh, sliding or spinning out and Craig crashing. Uh, here's two veterans that want to get off to a good start in the season. Right, well, Swink was uh, won the first moto there uh, last season in the 250 class, and we're thinking, okay, he's, he's the local. He should be the favorite. Moving into the 125 class, he should be able to, to muscle his way through those guys, and and he's pretty disappointing also for Craig. Number one and one for Schoen, showing what he could do outdoors. Possibly wow. a second place in that in the second moto. Let's move on to Hangtown, Sacramento. There was some space in between, and we had some supercross in between. And that proved disastrous at the time, anyway, for Lampson. Yeah, we were there at the time for the Supercross, and it was during practice, and we saw it, Art. We were down there watching practice. Lampson tried to go across all the top of the whoops, just skim across him, hold the throttle wide open. Of course, he was gaining momentum in the 250 class. It got away from him, and he wrenched that knee. And then, for sure, he thought the championship was going to be over in 125. So Hughes took the overall with a 1-3, and but Huffman, with a 2-2, moved into the points lead. And this is where I thought that Huffman was going to shine, because now Lampson's out of the picture, who seemed to be dominant, uh, at least in the championship. And Huffman, who dominated in the Supercross, now has been second overall the first two rounds. Very consistent. You know, he's showing signs that uh, maybe this title could be his. We saw two youngsters now starting to emerge. Tim Ferry winning the second Moto Yon, and Mike Brown a good performance. It really was. To see these guys all of a sudden really picking up that momentum, I mean, still, we didn't know who was going to step forward in the 125 class and really take dominance, and they really didn't. It was a battle all year. Then when we went to Mount Morris, Ferry won his first overall. Tim Ferry is an amazing guy. He comes back from injury. He broke his jaw, came back from that in Supercross, came back and then was strong in the outdoors. The guy is amazing. He really put something together. And then, of course, Mike Brown totally eclipsing his two teammates, which you would think would be the veterans, Swank and Craig. He came out and just stamped uh, his authority on some of the later rounds, too. Got his first moto win, Michelle Pichon. Another one. He rode excellent. And, uh, I think in the mud, he tends to ride a little bit better. He's sort of like Henry that way. And coming from Europe, there's a lot of rain over there, so he was comfortable in that situation. But real, real disappointing day for Ryan Hughes, crashing in the first corner, having to wait almost an entire lap to, un to get going. And uh, that was his worst finish of the year. It could have been disastrous for Lampson at that point because he was coming back, feeling his way, still had a sore knee, had, a, I think, a three and a five, and had a horrendous crash down below near the tree line. Well, I think it shows how tough he is. He knew he had to get out there and ride if he was going to win the championship. I think that he and Team Honda knew that he could do it, but I think all the rest of us, including the other riders, figure he can't. But I think he proved it to everybody that he just had to get out there and ride hurt, which some guys don't do this. Now, they don't do it as much anymore as they used to. I remember having to ride hurt almost my whole career. <laughs> and uh, Hannah did the same thing, Johnson, and a lot of us did, Mike Bell, and... and uh, 
But I, I think that Lampson, uh, that was a key moto. That second moto where he yes. fell and he got up and got fifth. I mean, that was a horrible crash. A knee injury. He had every reason. There's no way he's going to win the title. He's probably thinking at that time, why not just pull off? But he stayed in there, and it's a good thing. He came back to win because in the next event, Bud's Creek, it was Lampson. Well, that began a, a streak for Lampson, and, and yeah, four again, straight overalls. inconsistencies from the rest of the riders. Uh, Huffman was a points leader at the time, had a kind of a lousy day, and also Ryan Hughes again. Yeah, I think Huffman was asleep at the start once. Could uh, be. That, of course, the field, left, the, yeah. <laughs> the field left him. Think about Mike Brown, though. That left it open for him to come and then score well, finish second overall in that round, and here he was another contender, yeah. well alive in the championship. And Ferry doing well again with a moto win. When we come back, we'll have more 125 motocross year in review for you. Consistency and coolness of Lampson with a 2-2. It's interesting to me that he's really in desperation mode, Lampson is, because he has to close such a big gap in the championship, yet he comes out being consistent. Now, the consistency of Damon Huffman throughout the beginning part of the season still has him in the points lead. But Southwick is the first time he's won a moto. Everyone's kind of on his case, like, yeah. well, you got the points lead, but you haven't won anything. Well, he finally wins the moto, and uh, what I thought was interesting after the race was that everybody was totally exhausted, and Lampson, winning the overalls, is standing there like he'd go another moto, and so he just seems to and be a little bit... especially after the first moto, when he had to come back from ninth yeah. to take a second place. That was an interesting observation. Buchanan, now, was the next one on the list. Well, it was uh, Lampson all the way. I mean, wire to wire, and it's the first time we've seen Robbie Raynard ride well. Yep. Second in both motos, and he had to work his way up there, so... That was encouraging to see. Yeah, Don't you think that was the, really one of the parts of the year that people, the way that Lampson stamped his authority on the race, people are saying, whoa, maybe this guy can actually close down and he can challenge me in the championship. I think everyone had to really pick up the pace as soon as he started riding that way. Yeah, two hole shots leading every lap and, and uh, sweeping the thing. Well, I think at that point it wasn't really, a, he wasn't a threat to the title, but they're thinking if he continues to ride like this, that dominant, and, and like you said, riding conservatively at Southwick and still winning the overall and gaining points, plus everybody else is pretty inconsistent. So as long as you keep winning motos and finishing the top two or three, uh, you're going to close in fast. This would be the last time Damon Huffman led the points battle as we move to Troy, Ohio, and it's another sweep. It's getting boring. No, he's still fighting back. Lampson again. But I think Huffman was still in there strong. He ended up second overall in that round, and he still did have the points lead leaving Troy. It was later that he started running into trouble. I think that Huffman was as consistent as he needed to be, but now as Lamson was stamping his authority, who could match the speed of Lamson? And I think that's when now we start hearing a little more from Ryan Hughes and his style of hanging it out. Yes. I think I'm the one who can stay with Lamson. This was really the first time we saw the two, the rivalry that will be so important later on in the season with Hughes getting a 2-2. Mike Brown taking over the points lead, another points leader after this race. I was pretty impressed with his performance, just his consistency, and no one really expected him this far into the season. It's not that far, but farther than most people would expect Mike Brown to hold on to the points lead. And he was also for a top five, really, going into the season, and was just elated to find himself in this position. I bet. And then uh, Tim Ferry, uh, yes. the bad crash uh, with Denny Stevenson, and uh, he's out. I thought the way he was riding confidently, he might have a chance to get into that championship pool had it not been for that horrendous accident where Stevens saw him down, tried to adjust in midair, and then Ferry, in getting off the track, ran right into it. Yeah, the brakes don't work too good up in the air. <laughs> he tried everything he could do, but he was just, it was a, a bad place to fall. Yeah. Unadilla came next, the Rock Garden. Of oh. course, Ryan Hughes. Ryan Hughes is the name that came to everybody's mind as soon as we knew we were going to Unadilla. And then, of course, Steve Lampson came to mind, and that really was where he effectively lost the championship in 1994. Huge crash in the gravity cavity. We knew that was on his mind, and Ryan Hughes, full of confidence, saying, I love this place. Yeah, Hughes just shot out there, got the first motor lead, was leading the second, and then went down. But Lammy was able to be there for the opportunity and even in the first moto, Lampson coming from behind to move up their ladder. Well, again, for Lampson to have sort of an off day and to win a moto and to end up second overall and only lose a point, uh, <laughs> that's still pretty scary. I think at that point now, the points are close enough. Every, every rider's looking over their shoulder going, he's coming quick. Lampson went from 11th to 3rd in that first moto, if I remember correctly. That's a tough charge and a great track to do it. I mean, it's, it's very tough and demanding and, and rough. The riders get tired of the, the rain off and on all day. It's very difficult conditions, and Lampson proving his versatility there. And uh, also his strength to be able to, a great place to make a come, 
come back from behind on a track where there's tons of places to pass. Hughes takes over the point lead. We've got a new points leader in 125, and we'll be back with more of our 125 motocross year in review after this. 125 season, the battle lines were drawn. It was going to be a real war from here on out between Hughes and Lampson. But Millville, we had another star pop up. Right, well, everyone had their eyes on the real battle, but Robbie Raynard emerged and uh, looked fantastic. He hadn't had a very good round uh, yet this season. A couple of seconds was his best, but then uh, a broken throttle cable the last weekend, and finally gets a chance to shine. A couple of hole shots, wire to wire. Nobody could touch yeah. him. He got the win earlier in the first race of the season in the second moto, but then here was a sweep, and that's got to build his confidence for the Well, it, it didn't really help him a whole lot for the title, but it was definitely a win that he needed, and uh, Kawasaki was happy with that. They also won the 250 class that day. Lampson had a 3-2. Hughes was right up in there, I think, with a 2 and a 5. So we were tied in points, leaving Millville. Unbelievable to think we'd be tied in points at that stage. Robbie Raynard, as you mentioned, with that stamping his authority. Now, this was also contract time. This was the time that people were thinking about signing contracts with the factory teams. Who was going to go where? Some were signed, some weren't. I mean, there was a lot of pressure on these guys. That's right. Later Especially on, on Raynard, because at yes. that point, it was speculated that uh, possibly Huffman and Hughes had both signed for Kawasaki. So he's going, well, maybe I got to grab it today. <laughs> Then we went to the beautiful Pacific Northwest, Washougal, Washington, and that, the bubble burst for Lampson there. It really did. In moto number one, he ended up getting tangled up with Ryan Huffman. No relation to Damon Huffman. There wasn't any championship tactics being played there. But I think really after moto number one, finishing in 12th place, I think Lampson had that thought go through his mind, I may have just lost the championship. Yeah, it was an incredible run for him to get from so far back all the way up in there. And that 12th place could have taken him out of it. Robbie Raynard hurt his knee, but got a mo another moto win to show his potential, but it was opportunity for Mike Brown here. Well, like, like you said on Raynard, that was three motos in a row. It looked like he was on his way to maybe saving his championship hopes, but uh, after the second moto, Mike Brown really emerged, and uh, it, was, it was good to see him win that race and, and all that went with it. But you know, I think Art had the best seat in the house. I mean, <laughs> yes, we're up in the yes. booth, and we're thinking, hey, this is an opportunity for Mike Brown to take the overall. But then you knew what was going on down there. Yep. You repeated it for us. We knew that Jeff Nutter, he was nervous, and we found out later why he was nervous. They were going to shave all his facial hair. They were going to just take him, the beard, the mustache, the hair, everything. He was nervous, but he was really excited for Mike Brown. He didn't mind losing the hair. No, and so many mechanics came by the tent just to see the operation because they'd never seen another without a beard, uh, for that matter. But Hughes, even though it was a 3-4 for Hughes, he established a points lead, his most significant one of six points. Right, well, it was, it was he had an opportunity to really take advantage of the, the mishap by Lampson by going out and possibly winning that race, but he went 3-4 and... Although he picked up the points lead, I'm sure he would like to have a few more. Yes, because we went back to New York then, and uh, Brown, who came off the adulation of his first overall win, goes over the bars in the first race, and here we go. Let's throw the coins up again. Well, that, that took his title hopes away, and uh, I think Huffman kept his alive, went 2-2 there, and that, that had to semi-irritate Ryan Hughes, who oh, was yeah. going, why did, he, why did Huffman have to pick today to ride so good? <laughs> Ruin my he chance. got in between yes. Lampson and Hughes in that, in that respect. Yeah. Lampson's third sweep, and that was a, a real biggie. It was a real biggie for Lampson. He comes into the final round now, three points up. Now, David, does that put the pressure on Hughes, or does that put more pressure when you come in with only three-point advantage? Well, it's nice for Lampson to, to sweep the race before the title, to have that confidence to take to the last race, and also to pick up the points lead. But however, now, with the points lead, it's his title to lose. Yes, and he went into Delmont the last race of the season for moto number one, very tense. Mm. And he just was not relaxed on the track. It showed. Well, immediately. I don't, I don't think you can relax in that kind of situation. I don't think Ryan was relaxed either, but Ryan has a, the reputation of riding a little bit more erratic and making mistakes and, and falling down and still having a good day. I mean, that's more normal, I think, in his pro program than it is for Lampson. Lampson needs to have things go good. But it was a real wake-up call, too, for Lammy, because here all of a sudden Ryan Hughes is out in front of him, gets the three points he needs to tie the, for the points championship going into the very final moto. What drama. It was unbelievable. Who would have thought coming into the final moto of the year, moto number 24, that would be they're tied completely for the championship. And think about the pressure. You think there was pressure in moto number one. What about the pressure in moto number two? Well, that's 
about three or four who would have thought during this season. So very close. And, and uh, this, it really hasn't been this dramatic uh, that I can think of to go down to a title, the final moto since uh, uh, the famous let Brock by signal back in, I think, 77 between Dan Laporte, Brock Glover, and, and Bob Hanna. Hanna was winning a lot of the races, but he wasn't in the title chase, and uh, Brock ended up winning that. Yeah, because there were actually two uh, campaigns that were closer as far as points, but the five-point win for Lampson. Lampson uh, with a flawless pace out in front with this wild man in back of it. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, the speed on those downhills that they were creating, that uh, Hughes was going after it. Well, he was taking a lot of chances. When, when you got a guy behind you that's like Hughes, uh, you can't relax, I don't think. I mean, it, Lampson had enough of a lead to, to cool it a little, but with Hughes, you can't, because he's able to, to make up two or three, four seconds a lap, maybe, and he was trying everything he could do, and that's a real, uh, saying something for Lampson, because while Hughes is riding like a madman, Lampson's maintaining that same distance, so the pace was very fast. The most vivid picture of the entire season, in my mind's eye, is the crowd cheering for Lampson as he comes across with a checkered flag, and Hughes, with a broken chain, pushing that bike across the finish line, collapsing after he gets back with a bike on top of him and the fans absolutely going bananas, some with tears in their eyes. It was. It was one of the most dramatic pictures that we had. It reminded those auto racing fans of Nigel Mansell pushing a Formula One car across the line. I think it was the Dallas Grand Prix. I mean, that shows to me Ryan Hughes, the kind of enthusiasm, the kind of drive that he has. It didn't make a difference in the championship. I guess it might have. If a few more guys would have got by him, that might have left the door open for somebody to take his spot. But he just, he was, what else could you do? It was amazing yeah, to watch. The he heart, the heart of a lion. He won't You're quit. And I thought it was interesting, too, that uh, Jeff Stanton, who had had an accident himself earlier in the season, uh, Lampson was there while that happened. And Lampson going to the final round, he needed something. And Honda, the, the organization that they are, they pull together and do whatever it takes to, to make their riders relax and to win championships. So he was there for Lampson, but when he saw Hughes collapse, he went over and gave Hughes water. Coming up next the 1995 season through the champion's eyes. Why your Suzuki dealer has the ride you've been waiting for and the financing to get it. First moto went really well, and I won that, and I was really happy about that. And then second moto, I got out to, you know, a good start, and was winning that for the lap, and just uh, exploded the front wheel and rode a few more laps, and I had to pull in. And I mean, I, at that time, I was just so bummed out. I mean, I wanted to win that first race, and and you know, you know, set the first race and win it and win the rest, you know. So, I mean, it happened, and it, you know, I wasn't very happy about it, but there's nothing I could do about it either. So I just had to go on about it. The beginning of Steve Lampson's 1995 outdoor national season was filled with hardship. An injured knee at the Dallas Supercross forced him to pass at Sacramento. Basically two back-to-back -back negatives. I mean, I got hurt Dallas the week before, and I mean, that just blew it right there. I was so bummed out about that, and I was just worried about getting back for the third race at Mount Morris, being healthy for that, because I knew it would be close. So, you know, I just had to, had to take it and just try to... My attitude is to come back and win as many races as I could and not worry about the championship because I didn't think I could really pull it off even if I won every race, but it did change around after that. That morning when it started raining and I wasn't uh, too happy about that because that was my worst thing I could think of my first race back and I just wanted it to be dry and no ruts. I didn't really tweak my knee and that's the first thing I could think of is catching my knee in the ruts and, and rain and all that. And It turned out all right. I mean, it was to my advantage in the first moto, I think, and it didn't affect me that much. So not really worrying about my knee so much and then when I got off and crashed pretty bad um, it kind of went through my mind it really didn't hurt that bad but you know it really didn't affect my my knee that much when I crashed but it kind of took took it out of me I mean before that race I wasn't able to ride that much and I was more so tired and beat after I got done crashing there so I just kind of had to ride around the rest of the race um, just holding on a cautious Lampson finished 3-5 at Mount Morris, but encouragement from Team Honda and inconsistency from the series' top three, Damon Huffman, Ryan Hughes, and Mike Brown,
kept Lammy's hopes for at least a shot at the title alive. Yeah, I did. I mean, I've always been a real consistent rider, and, and uh, I know the 125 class has always been inconsistent, and it seems like guys getting good one moto, bad one moto, and it seemed like Brown stayed pretty consistent, and maybe Huffman was going up and down, and Hughes were going up and down, and, and also Ferry. And I gained a lot of points with them having one good moto, one bad moto, me having two good motos. So, you know, I mean, I, it always pays off to be consistent, which I've always been that way. So I think it'll, you know, definitely pay off in the future. Championships aren't born, they are made. Round four at Bud's Creek was Steve's first healthy race. Strong body, strong mind. The groundwork was ready to be laid. Well, at that point, I still wasn't, wasn't counting on much. I mean, I went in there and I had a little bit of time between Mount Morrison there to heal up a little bit more and get back on track. And I mean, it, it paid off there and showed there that I was able to, you know, ride like I have in the past. So, um, I did catch a lot of points up there and, and uh, a lot of guys were starting to get inconsistent by then. And, and I was just kind of open-minded by then. I mean, I knew I caught up a lot, but I just figured, ah, could happen. Next stop, Southwick, Massachusetts. A physical and demanding track, a sandy, dry surface. Experience and conditioning usually dictate the podium finishes. I've always been pretty good in the sand because I raced up, up in Marysville up north. I mean, every weekend when I was growing up in the sand and the sand, so I had a lot of experience in it, and I like it a lot, and it shows who's uh, in shape, who's not in, sh you know, not in shape. And it was a good race for me. I mean, I got the overall with a 2-2, but I didn't want to go 2-2. But um, bad starts, and, and uh, Huffman rode pretty good there. So, you know, I just was glad to win. I mean, I ride the sand really well, and I get pretty decent start second moto and battled with Huffman the whole way. And that was a pretty good race there. And I think I took a lot out of me first moto trying to catch up through the pack. I kind of was a little bit burnt second moto. So I kind of backed it down and just took second, and which might pay off, you know. I mean, I mean, it did pay off. I mean, doing that, and sometimes you think, oh, you can't get second, you got to win. But if I'd have threw it away or something like that, I'd be, you know, wondering at the end of the year, oh, if I'd have been a little bit smarter at that time, it wouldn't have happened, you know. Point. Listen closely as Steve describes the sweep, his confidence growing with every moto win. It was easy as it looked. I mean, when everything goes good, I mean, I mean, I came off the track, both motos, not even really breathing hard, you know, so, I mean, I rode really good there. I came from, you know, from maybe fourth, the first moto, and I pretty much whole shot the second moto, but I rode really well. I mean, I was strong the whole time. I was 100% healthy and uh, kind of hanging back at Stanton's house, and that kind of helped a lot, too, you know, hanging out with him and doing a little bit of training back there, but, I mean, it was great for there. I mean, when everything goes good, I mean, you know, it doesn't even feel like you really have to try that hard. Some races when things aren't going that good and I, you know, get fifth or tenth or something like that, and I come off and just hate in life, you know, and it's the, when you're in front, everything's flowing good. I mean, it, it's, it's that much easier on yourself, you know, you just feel it come off and you don't, you just feel like you still have the energy to go ride more, you know. Usually you don't do that. Outside elements always come into play during an outdoor national campaign. Round seven in Troy, Ohio, saw record high temperatures. Still, Lammy's talking the talk and walking the walk. Well, Friday when we rode there, it was <laughs> bad. And it kind of cooled off a little bit and we got a little bit of rain, but it still was pretty hot, pretty hot there. And uh, I figured it's to my advantage, if, you know, if anything is. And uh, that race was good for me. I mean, I won both motos there again, so I was pretty, same thing, I came off and I, I was feeling good, you know, after the motos. And uh, I just felt strong, I pretty much, you know, smoked everybody both motos and just like the week before. At that time, I knew I had a shot at it because, I mean, I was, at that time, I gained a lot of points, you know, between the two, those two races there. So I was uh, thinking a little different then. Unadilla is always a tough test. Lampson's painful loss here the previous year handed the championship to his teammate, Doug Henry. The confidence from four straight moto wins, all but gone from Steve's voice. Yeah, it was, I just, uh, I, when I thought that, I just go, oh, I'll make it first through the first lap here, and I uh, don't crash the gravity cavity, and everything will be fine. And the first moto wasn't that great. I got third, and uh, that's the first third I had in a while. And I wasn't at that time after winning four motos. I was like, third? What's that's horrible, you know? I mean, which it's not, but it felt horrible to me doing that. And uh, that track always has been a little bit not my track to ride, and I 
you know, I rode the best I could there. And second moto, I rode a little bit better. And as uh, we got the downpour there, it was pretty muddy, but it uh, went my way. I always prefer it not to rain and just be a dry, good race, you know, make it for better racing. But, you know, I can ride when it comes to, to the mud and stuff. I can ride okay in that. I, I don't mind it, but it's like some tracks you feel a little more comfortable than other tracks. And uh, I just don't feel as comfortable on the Unadilla track. Well, I know Unadilla usually isn't the track that I usually do well on. And I just kind of, after the last year there in 94, throwing it away and uh, not doing so hot there, I just, I wasn't happy getting third first moto, but then winning the second moto was okay doing that. So I was just happy to get out there, be out of there getting, you know, decent points and, you know, not throwing it away like I did last year. Enter Robbie Raynard. The youngster from Oklahoma who has suffered one injury after another since turning pro. He rode Millville like there was no tomorrow and was rewarded with the overall win. Yeah, Robbie, when he first got signed up, I think everyone expected him to pretty much go out and win every race. And I think he had a lot of pressure on, on himself for that. And uh, he's been hurt a lot and had a lot of ups and downs. I mean, when the guy's on, he has good starts. I mean, he's very hard to beat like he was at Millville. I mean, won both motos and I mean, rode pretty hard and I couldn't even couldn't really catch him so I mean he's been on and off I mean he has a good moto bad moto and so but that that weekend he was on at Millville there you can go out and ride as hard as you can and try to win every moto but you're gonna be getting off and crashing and hurting yourself and not getting points so I mean that always I learned a lot last year I mean doing that I mean you gotta be smart when it comes down to it when you're gonna throw it away and lose everything I mean you got to be smart and use your head in that situation. Three rounds remaining. Washougal is where Steve would finally catch the inconsistent group at the top. Ironically, it was Orion and Huffman, but not what you're thinking, who would delegate a 12th place finish for Lamson. At that time, I mean, it was on the first lap, and I didn't get that great of a start. And I figured out, I'm mean, going to just get through, the, get through the first lap and just try to catch everyone. But, uh... I don't remember who, I think it was Ryan Huffman, uh, got out of control down the downhill and pretty much took me out. And that time I just wanted to, I don't know, I kind of wanted, I was so mad I wanted to fight, you know, and I went, oh man, I better get back up and get going, you know. So I, you know, gathered myself up and I was so far behind and Washougal's a bad track to be coming from behind. It seems like everyone goes pretty fast there. It's such a fast track and, you know, hard to catch up. So I was uh, lucky just to get up, I think, to, I don't know, I think I get 12 that time, that moto, and at least I have some points. But at that time, I started thinking a little bit negative that oh, there goes the championship points again. You know, I caught up, and now I'm losing them again. So, But I just kind of had to gather myself up and uh, go out in moto two, and I did a lot better there. So. Drawing attention all season long was number 26, Mike Brown. Lampson would recover with a second-place finish in the following moto, but Brown would steal the spotlight with his first-ever outdoor national win and the overall victory at Washougal. Well, he, he's been the next consistent guy I, I consider in 125 class because he's never, he has not had any bad motos. He's been right there, two, three, four, you know. And uh, I mean, he had it coming to him. I mean, he's been there every week and this is the best year he's had and he's been riding really well. So, um, I mean, that, that was good for him. I mean, I wish I was up there winning, but uh, the 12-2, you can't be getting the overall with that. So, at least a Honda did it. <laughs> Unbelievable. The rider battle continued between Hughes, Huffman, Brown, and Lamson, all knowing what was needed to become the champion. That race, I, I knew I had to go out there and win each moto and uh, to get up there in the points, basically. And uh, I got like a 12th place start, I think, the first lap. And uh, all I could see was Hughes and Brown in first and second. And I just was, it wasn't good for me. I mean, then I kind of worked through the pack, and I seen Brown on the ground, and uh, then he picked himself up right behind me, that moto. And uh, then he was, next thing I know, he was gone. So I knew at that point he was pretty much out of it. I mean, when it came down to that, only basically three or four motos left. I mean, you got to be up there winning. And uh, I worked through the pack, and I knew I had to, and I pretty much passed Huffman, which um, I knew he was a factor, so it was good to get by him. And I knew I had to get by Hughes at that time. and. Uh, I mean, I rode hard that moto, and I and I ended up getting by him and pulling out a little bit and helped because Huffman got in between us there, so it gave me a little little more uh, points, point leeway there, and uh, started getting closer then. 
at that point, I, I mean, what I was thinking during that week is, I'm like, man, if I get out there and I can beat Ryan the first moto, you know, I give me six points on him, I can maybe sit back in third, the second moto, and uh, you know, I can still get the championship. But after the first moto, I mean, we both rode as hard as we could, and he came out on top of that moto, and I knew it was tied. So it's like, oh gosh, I mean, so many things go through your head at that time. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, it might not be that bad, but I mean, all week and. Race day, I mean, you're always thinking about it and you're not yourself and you try not to, but I mean, it affects you in a way. Well, I, I mean, I was nervous. I mean, a lot of things were going through my head and uh, I'm sure Ryan was feeling the same. I mean, we both had the pressure on and uh, I mean, I was, just so many things go through your head. I mean, I was thinking, oh man, I worked this hard and caught this many points at the win the championship and if I, if I don't win it, it's like I'm going to be like miserable for the rest of my life. But I, that's what I felt like, you know, I mean, worked that hard and and came that close. I mean, I had that going through my head, and you know, I had to beat Ryan, you know, to get the, get the championship, and I knew he was going to be strong, and so, I mean, I had a lot of things go through my head, and I wasn't wasn't myself that race day, I know that. That topped it all off. I mean, I, after that, I was just, I was so mad at myself for letting my, myself get second that moto, which wasn't that bad, but I mean, it tied us up in points, and whoever won the next moto would get it, so. You know, lined up for that race, I mean, we lined up side by side, and it's like, you know, a lot of tension going on there before the moto, and you know, once we, I figured whoever's gonna get the whole shot's gonna win, you know, and I did get the whole shot, and he was close behind, you know, four or five seconds whole moto, and I mean, that's the best moto I think I've raced that I've ridden, you know, all year, or in my lifetime, I think, under pressure and not making any mistakes. I mean, that whole moto, I'm thinking, oh, he's gonna make a mistake, I'm gonna get a little bit of a break, you know, to, you know, re relax a little bit, but it never happened, and I think, you know, Ryan was probably thinking that, you know, same on my part, you know, he's going to make a mistake. I'm going to, you know, get up there and pass him. So when I crossed the finish line, I mean, it was the biggest relief of my life. I mean, just racing 35 minutes, just, I mean, the toughest race of my life right there. And I mean, I was so relieved when I got done with that race. I mean, it was just the greatest thing in my life, you know, to come across and know that I, I had won, you know, and seeing everyone there, you know, greeting me and my family and, you know, everyone at Honda and stuff. So it's a good feeling. I looked back and when I crossed the finish line, I didn't see him, so I knew something happened in both the last little section there. And uh, I mean, I felt bad for him. I mean, here we are just battling it out the whole time. I mean, how it was, if it wouldn't have happened, I'd have still won a championship or won the moto and won a championship. But just to happen, you know, 100 yards from the finish line, he's got to push his bike up the hill. I mean, he's probably ready to die when it, when it ended, you know. I mean, I know what it takes to just ride a moto like that, you know, and uh, push your bike. Most guys, I think, would have drop their bike and uh, threw a little tantrum, but I gotta give him credit. I mean, he pushed his bike up and he got third, and I gotta give him credit, and I think everyone else gave him a, little, a lot of credit for doing that. Empathetic words from a deserving 1995 125cc outdoor national champion, and one of pro motorcycle racing's all-time best season-long comeback story. I mean, it didn't sink in for, for a little while at least, but I mean, I'm so happy, I mean, I mean, it's the first championship I ever won, and I'll always remember that, you know. And I mean, I worked hard for it, and, you know, I came close last year, but then this year, how it started out, I mean, it didn't look good, and I was really bummed out about, you know, how my series started in 125, and I figured it was over at that time, but I mean, it all worked out at the end, and, uh, and it was great. Older brother, older sister, and um, I pretty much, uh, schoolboy and did my schoolwork and uh, raced BMX bicycles for a while and uh, until I got into motorcycles and, and went from there. Yeah, he, uh, my mom and my dad, I mean, loved the sport and they uh, went with me everywhere and did whatever they had to do to take me racing and, you know, I owe it to them. I mean, they did a lot. Um, I think a, a lot of guys seemed like they had a, a lot of money and or their parents had a lot of money so they just kind of took them to the top, you know, and didn't have to do that much work. I mean, I, I know my parents didn't have a lot of money and they had to do whatever they had to do to get me to the races and I went with them and traveled everywhere. So um, I know I put in my time doing that. No mistakes for Lampson in the Wolves as he takes the corner and Lampson bobbles again. Here comes Jeremy. Oh my goodness. Jeremy looks back at his teammate as he takes the lead on the final lap. I need to do better Supercross. I mean, I started out last year hurt, or this year actually, I'm hurt a little bit. So um, this year I'm gonna go out and try to win some races and there's no reason I can't. I came close a couple times this year and uh, I know learned a lot this year and know what I need to do for, ne for next year. Like so many great riders before him, when they've reached that level of champion, 
and the fine line to the runner-up spot is thin, Steve has turned to conditioning for an edge. Routine is his key. Long runs, some occasional mountain biking, and of course, the inevitable water workout is a must. Scurfing throws a little excitement into the mix, and there's always time for a good wrestle with this golden retriever, Otis. Huh? Huh? But Steve's newest interest is that of fiance, Cammie Abbott. The two make an inseparable team. A daily visit to Brittany's, the local restaurant, gives the couple some much needed time for themselves. It's hard. Um, we're in a different state every other weekend. We stay in a lot of hotels. Um, you know, all you can do is support him and try to keep his chin up when it's down and take care of all the things around the house that he doesn't have time to do is what I basically take care of, the paperwork, the, the lawn, everything, taking care of the animals, but um, it's, it's all worth it. Um, yeah, we are gonna get married September 30th, and uh, we've been planning a couple years, been living together for three years now, so um, she's always been behind me ever since the start, and uh, you know, I enjoy having her around and coming to the races, and, and she works really hard to you know, do whatever it takes to make me happy, and uh, you know, I'm pretty happy to be getting married. And uh, what I said before before the um, championship was over, it'd be a nice wedding present to win the championship, so uh, definitely nice. Wondering if the newly crowned champion did anything just for himself? We did. One of my buddies, Mike, across the street, he made a bet with me kind of through the year that if I won a championship that I had to get a tattoo, number one plate on my arm. So uh, when it came home, I had to do it. Can you see it? Not a tattoo type of guy, but I got it. <laughs> 